Hello and welcome to CoinStruct, the podcast where we look at the world of finance and cryptocurrency from a more human perspective. On today's show, we have McFly, the pseudo-anonymous chief and staff of ATA MPH. ATA MPH is a fixed interest rate yield-bearing protocol and has previously been shouted out in the media by names such as Andre Cronge, Elio Trades and Molly Wintermute. McFly and I talk building, building Ethereum dApps and building communities for said dApps. As you may notice from our conversation, McFly and I have previously met. I am actually working over at ATMPH in a community facing role and McFly was kind enough to come onto the podcast and talk a little bit about ATMPH, the V3 and his general experience in crypto. However, disclaimer, none of the opinions or the information in this podcast should be considered as financial advice. I hope you enjoy listening. All right. Well, I guess you should probably introduce yourself. I, I, I was worried about uh, doxing you. I don't know if you want to be doxed. I checked your Twitter this morning and you had taken off your profile picture. So I didn't want to actually say your name. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself as oh, no, who yeah. you want to be. Don't, don't worry. Yeah, no, yeah. The, no, no issue with that. It's just like, I was tired of this uh, of <laughs> <face>. and <laughs> I, yeah. I was wondering if the, the green on green was like the new laser eyes. So once you posted the green on green, <laughs> the market's going to go up. So we'll see how it goes the next yeah, couple of days. Yeah, this is my, my bullish uh, sentiment, my bullish uh, alpha leak, <laughs> like everything green. Market is green. Well, I have heard you coined as the future of France. So maybe, maybe that's the living up to that name. <laughs> actually i want to ask you what i mean obviously you're a builder uh, on the ethereum network in particular and you're also french so what is it about france that has um such a strong kind of ethereum builder community like why is that you know the eth cc uh, the paris convention other things like this where people you know they, there's a big gathering and it's often in france why mm. Uh, probably because like uh, around two, 2016, there was guys like uh, uh, the, the founder of Ledger, uh, the guys of uh, Maison du Bitcoin, uh, who created after CoinHouse, uh, were kind of like uh, maybe the Kickstarter of some community around Ethereum. And after in 2017, when there was the first bull run, around like uh, Ethereum, there was a lot of things happening, uh, meetup, um, conferences around all to build on Ethereum. And there was like a strong community around developers. So for example, I was living at, at, at the north of France in Lille and there was like two or three different um, meetup, uh, like monthly meetup with uh, like developers talk uh, even in uh, Belgium, if you were crossing the, the, the border, you were able to go to Ghent and uh, Liège, for example, and you you had like some meetup there. It was like dying after in 2018 because like it was kind of the start of winter there for crypto. Uh, but during yeah a bit more than one year, it was like really something happening a lot, and I was like working for a startup incubator and like there was like thousands of dev and like everyone was talking about like, how to start building web free stuff and I, after it was a trend but i i think it kickstarted a lot of things around the, the developer community there sure yeah it makes sense because i hear i hear lots of lots of talk about france in terms of kind of meetups even now but it makes sense that that was the height of it back in 2017 um, is that kind of where you learned most of your building skills or would you say you knew it previous to this? Uh, me, I st- like we started building stuff with Zephram in uh, late 2017. Um, so Did you meet Zephram uh, in, in like, these conventions? No, no, we, we met on, uh, on Reddit. Oh, cool. And uh, I was like doing my own things, uh, working, collaborating with other teams. Like we were building before, like a DEX aggregator. Uh, the name was Shiftly.finance. Uh, so I was like, yeah, trying to explore and see what I can bring in terms of expertise, like regarding, yeah, 
design, product development, uh, front end stuff. But um, it was just, yeah, the beginning of a long journey to uh, what we, we are currently doing. Yeah. So you guys yeah, have built three projects all, like, together now, right? You've built B Token, Bacon Labs, and now ATA MPH. Yeah, like the Bacon Lab is more like the dev shop. It's not really a project, it's just a commercial entity. But there was like, to start, there was Btoken that fund. After there was um, F12, Fantastic 12 uh, network. It was a product where you were able to deploy a DAO on top of a Discord server. Um, and after AK8 MPH, uh, late 2019. And Bacon Lab was like, the entity, the legal entity, uh, the umbrella legal entity uh, for like covering the activities there. Yeah. Cool, yeah. But yeah, we started like yeah with uh, with Bitoken that fund and after eighty eight MPH right okay. now. Yeah, I mean eighty MPH is uh, for those who don't know a fixed rate lending protocol built on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, currently in V two and very soon, just like UDSwap, V three is coming right. <laughs> yeah, hopefully before you miss it. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So currently what we are doing with the uh, 88 MPH, as you said, uh, like the main product is a fixed interest rate. Uh, uh, we are based on the bond system. And what we are trying to achieve with the V3 is uh, improving the user experience uh, for the end users and for the developers who want to build on top of us. Because currently there is some constraints building on top of us, like there is people building on top of us, like there is uh, some yield aggregators like Mushroom that finance or like other projects like the Basonomics. Uh, but it's really, really with a lot of constraints. So we want to remove these constraints to be able to uh, be as easy as building on top of Compound or Ave and Allo over guys to build strategy easily on top of us. Sure, just to make so, it clear, um, the, the, ATM PH yeah. is kind of considered as a what do they say, DeFi primitive. Is that the term that's going around now? Uh, you know, a, a, a yeah, base layer yeah. protocol that other layers, can, other protocols can build on top of, right? Yeah, like is what we what we want since the beginning, and like we are like we can say like it's a DeFi primitive. Um, and the other things we want to focus with the V3 is uh, being able to de-risk the protocol uh, and be sure that at the end of the day, all of that will work in any market conditions. Like where, when numbers go up or numbers go down, it will work the same way and it will be as effective as it is uh, when there is a bull run or a beer, a beer, a beer cycle. So yeah, that's the main focus. And um, that's something I've been wondering: is so, are these are projects that are building now and have been building for you know the last year or so? Are they prepared for a bear market when it comes around? You know, does their business model or their project token model still function as well during a bear market? Uh, it's something that's kind of concerning me. Yeah, probably not. Like uh, since we 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 got uh, like at least two two big beer markets since uh, like the, the beginning of the forum uh, like there will be a lot of things that will die and it's, it's fine because like it's, nature is working like that so it will be just an evolution cycle uh, i i suppose a lot of builders who are just relying on some tokenomics and inflation to make their, their products su successful and attract a lot of uh, users currently, if they are not prepared for like when everything will go down, uh, and the incentives won't exist anymore, um, I don't know. Like yeah, probably they won't last much. Yeah, it's not. It's not just the cryptocurrencies themselves that are potentially a house of cards. It may be some of the projects themselves as well. So it's um, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting winter. I think. I think it's going to be a real winter this winter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that is like I, I see it as a, like a really good thing because it's like just a, a Darwinism uh, uh, applicated to 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 DeFi and as everything like there is social Darwinism, there will be technical Darwinism and tokenomic Darwinism, and 
it would be just helpful for everyone to learn uh, new stuff yeah. when everything Agreed. would go Sometimes soft. you have to get rid of the, uh, the dead weight. I've got a list of ones I think <laughs> might happen, but uh, that's a personal list. <laughs> um, I want to know why, why, why the uh, back to the future um, aesthetic for ATA MPH? Where did that even come from? You know, obviously it came from the movie, but why did you guys choose ATA MPH and that entire aesthetic? Yeah, uh, as I was previously mentioning, we were uh, starting building, drafting smart contracts around uh, the concept of 88 MPH in October 2019. Uh, we were trying, the first model was around a swap rate, uh, but after we quickly quickly thought it was like a bad idea in terms of scalability and user experience because like nobody wants to wait to get his fixed interest rate. So uh, swap rate, and we can see today with the product we're based on this kind of model, it doesn't scale really well. And in terms of user acquisition, it's really, really hard uh, to, to make it. So we we thought that maybe we can think about something where it's peer to contract. Uh, that means that you don't need to wait to get your fixed interest rates. and the other thing is we wanted to give you the interest upfront. So you are depositing 100 DAI, for example, and the current fixed interest rate is 5%. You will get upfront 5, uh, five DAI. So it's kind of like future forwarding your money. And is where the reference to back to the future and 88 MPH uh, was, uh, was born. Um, so we just kept the brand 88 mph but we we we, we discontinued the, the features of upfront interest rates uh because it's a bad thing in terms of like performances like you can't really compound and yeah in terms like yeah just like is if you're offering the, the upfront uh if you're offering upfront the interest like is in terms of pulling all of that and at the end having a better performances by the pooling effect you 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 won't you won't have that so we just removed it uh, for the, the release we we launched in november so yeah basically ATA mph it took us one year to iterate on it like we started with swap rates we went with upfront interest uh, and after we we got a bit distracted during uh, last summer because we were bootstrapping everything ourselves uh, for paying for security audits and this kind of thing. So we were uh, selling a white label uh, license of Bitoken uh, fund to a guy in Switzerland. So we were working for someone else to have like some money uh, to help us bootstrap 88 MPH and release it uh, during fall of um, of 2020. So. It was a bit of distraction, but at the end of the day, it was also good because we we learned so much uh, with all the things we were happening during the summer of DeFi uh, last year, uh, like the way to do fair launch, a, a good way to do fair launch things, uh, the way to build a community around the project and create new incentives that make sense for everyone at the end of the day. So it was a being late and being a bit distracted was the best thing uh, i suppose that uh, could happen to us so um yeah it was a necessary time to think more about our model uh, because what we were raising in june like that was a first main version in april um after we got a grant from Ave to help us with like security audit things so we we did an audit in june and we released a new version that was audited, but that wasn't great. And there wasn't a much, like, much traction. To be honest, it was like a failure, this project at the beginning. Uh, we were like with it, not even 20 users, like oh, for wow. several months. Uh, so it was like with like 300 followers, like maximum and, and that thing for months. So until. Until October of 2020, uh, when we started announcing and chilling the new version and everything launching in November, is where we started having like some traction because the model was different and we were like documenting all of that and starting talking with people, gathering feedbacks. 
So yeah, it was like a long, long winter for us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I think that that kind of that kind of beginning uh, makes a project even better, right? You know, because you've you've been you've had the ups and the downs, and it makes you appreciate things kind of a lot more as they are. If you launched at the beginning and everything yeah. was sick to begin with, you'd maybe not appreciate where you guys are at. So at, you know, at this point now, um, and I'll be honest, when you when you guys. Uh, re- I don't know. Was it a relaunch in October? Is that a relaunch? Um, uh, in November. November, yeah. So when you relaunched in November, uh, I heard three people from the Harvest Discord whose opinions I respect more than anyone's. Right, one guy in particular. His name's Brandon. Brandon Curtis from Radar. I don't know if you know. Um, and he was saying some really lovely things about ATMPH. And luckily, I was you know no financial, not financial advice, but I was nice and early and introduced to you guys and it was it's been a really strong interesting and organic start i think which is the best part because you know you have people who shout you out but in general it's all organic which i love to see yeah t- t- talking about like uh, the way to to kick start a community uh, like if people who will watch us like and listen to us after when you will publish that if they want to start building something and having a community around it, like don't start by paying people to shield your project. Like it will, it will fail. Don't start with pay channel. Uh, what you can do um, is make sure you are trying to connect with your technical partners. Like if you are building on top of other protocols, like start being friendly with them and see or you can work on some uh, like core shield campaigns and like core marketing campaign it will be really really more effective than starting like trying to get uh, you in some page paid shield campaign on twitter or yeah. like youtube is really it doesn't work and we we are we are never doing that uh, like we just tried once to to pay for her AMA on Telegram and this was like really 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 a bad idea. <laughs> so yeah, the, the main thing is yeah that like if you are like fr- if you are friendly and if you if you, you want to create like real synergy with other protocol is the way you will attract new members in your community and, and have like as well. really good friends and a real community because like it's really easy like i can build you in two months a community of ten thousand guys on telegram but it will be a dead community what you want is like maybe just a thousand or maybe just 300 people but really active what you want is engagement when you're building your community and people recommending you at the end of the day so mm-hmm. It doesn't matter absolute number, uh, like people bragging about like, and it's the same for like, it's, it's the same for the number of followers, it's the same for the TVL, it's the same for everything. Like uh, r- real absolute number doesn't mean anything. What you need to care about is engagement of uh, the way you can extract value from, from that. So it's interesting you say TVL absolute, because yeah. even TVL, you know, you can have high quality TVL and low quality TVL. And, you know, the number can go up, but the person who's, you know, the person who's deposited it, if they are someone, you know, unfriendly to the project, someone who's not, you know, in line with the vision that the project has, that will come, but it will go and it will go soon afterwards. And you can base, you know, oh, we got 100 million or 88 million TVL uh, or whatnot, but it goes and you have no connection with these people. So it's best to, like you say, to build something that people actually enjoy being a part of. People respect your community. They respect mm-hmm. your token, what you're trying to build. Um, my experience in crypto has mainly been based entirely around community because of the three projects that I work with. Um, and from my from my kind of experience, I think that any paid shills, bar one TA that I paid, for, uh, AMA that I paid for on, t- on Telegram, they have all been just people who are looking to buy and to sell once it does a 2X. And those people have almost no interest in the project itself. Most of these people wouldn't want to, for example, ATMPH deposit into the front page. They'd want to buy the token, wait for it to go up and sell the token. And that's not really the kind of person mm. that you want involved in your in your ecosystem at all. Um, ATMPH is building a nice community for sure. Uh, 
Asia, Asian China operations will be kicking off soon from my end. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I would like to yeah, actually. Yeah, is, you go. The, no, yeah, I just wanted to add something regarding like the 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 sense you, you the way you can create a synergy with your community and what really matter at the end is uh, the fact that you will have some retention. Uh, people will come back to your community over and over again and. Is the same for the TVL at the end of the day. What you want is a sticky TVL and not like some like mercenary TVL where it's just there for two weeks and you can't really monetize it. Uh, what you want is like really building some loyalty uh, regarding the TVL, having it for long term, uh, like depending on your product, but at least for our context with 88 MPH. 88 MPH is not like something that will offer you like 100% of APY is something that is more like long term, a long term game. Um, so we want to be sure that there is some loyalty regarding the TVL. And we don't really care if it's not yet a billion. Uh, what we want is being sure that we can monetize it at the end of the day and transferring that value to our uh, MPH stakers because we are sharing 100% of the protocol revenue to, to our MPH stakers. So uh, it's really that kind of cash dividend that really matter at the end of the day and that make your project really lasting uh, on like a long-term horizon. Yeah, there's, there's, there's actually very few projects that are giving a solid cash flow back in tokens and ATMPH is one of them, uh, Harvest Finance also one of them. Um, you said about sticky TVL. Now, this is something that is obviously a huge thing for, especially growing um, projects with you know with front page deposits. But sticky TVL, in the grand scheme, requires large whales to come in and to like your project, to believe in it, and to deposit and stay. Now, there's a bit of a kind of idea floating around that this kind of synergy between whales and DeFi protocols requires some kind of you know background conversations which of course it does so the ethereum as you said like 2017 in france right there was lots of meetups lots of uh, lots of people getting together and building groundbreaking tech a bit of a winter but in general people in ethereum the builders tend to know each other you know if you're in the, in a backroom conversation with one of them they say oh i'll speak to you know andre or I'll go speak to Mark Mackie or something. You know, the people just know each other. And these are the, the the superstars of DeFi, right? So is there a sense of is there a sense of the the DeFi playground is basically being molded and built around what the DeFi whales want and need, and everybody else is just kind of getting a chance to play in their playground. Yeah, like currently, it's like real talk thing, like real talk things is definitely DeFi is just a small village with a lot of big whales. Yeah, you know. uh, is like definitely we are not building for like uh, for me, Mister Nobody. <laughs> like, yeah, like it's definitely not sustainable uh, if you are like just targeting retails uh, who can't pay like two hundred dollar their transaction for depositing in your protocol. So it doesn't make any sense for like chasing these kind of guys who just want to to play with one thousand dollars. So at the end of the day, is like I'm like we are really conscious and transparent with everyone regarding that we are not like building for retails and whether like is dreaming that uh, DeFi in the next two months will be like retail friendly is like really dreaming too much. Yes. So yeah, at the end of the day, you are just chasing wealth. And when people are like uh, bullshitting on, on Twitter about like DeFi primitive and selling their bags around like, oh, beautiful it is. At the end of the day, when you say DeFi primitive is basically, can I have a share of your TVL and your friendly whale? I want to play in your background, in your garden, and so wallet garden. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it's like that. Hopefully, there is optimism, there is zk thing, there is 
layer two stuff that can bring more more retail. Uh, but there is like every week there is someone asking us, when are you starting building on layer two? Uh, when are you starting to build on this uh, side chain or this chain or this one? Uh, the thing is, we can build on whatever chain we want, but is as we are like chasing composability, if there is no liquidity there and there is no the players we need for make, making sure of H8 and PH work, it doesn't matter. So we prefer currently to wait a bit and see where everyone is going. It's like when you were at the beginning of 2010, there was Windows starting playing with an OS for mobile. There was Android, there was iOS. At the end of the day, right now, there is just Android and iOS and uh, uh, it's still like the best one is still iOS because it's where you will do the most of your business. Uh, so we just want to be sure that we are going in the right direction and uh, be sure that when we will go on a layer two or like an overscaling solution, it will be not the perfect one, but the one where there will be the most liquidity and where there will be like the most uh, friendly retail experience possible. Um, yeah, we me, don't um, want to chase trends regarding. Yeah, yeah, that makes me feel uh, positive as a as an MPH in you know interested person because it shows that you are thinking long term, right? Because there's so many, like you say, there's so many L two solutions out there right now. There's BSC, there's Matic, there's a, you know, Avalanche, Solana, other one, you know, Solana's not L two, but you know, other things coming up, and you could potentially port to any of them. However, none of them have really proven themselves yet. Um, I, Of all of them, I like Polygon the most, but you know, again, it's just starting. Um, and like you say, you, why not wait a little bit, get V3 out, sort the fundamentals, and then when the one reigns a bit more supreme, take that one. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned about liquidity. So something the MPH does incredibly well is incentivizes liquidity mining, right? Uh, on the MPH website, you have three different liquidity incentivizing pools. There is the Uniswap MPH, uh, MPH ETH Uniswap pool, the MPH ETH Sushi Swap pool, and the MPH Link Link Swap pool, a personal favorite of mine. Um, why is liquidity so important for a project? I mean, in particular, AT MPH, but in general, why is liquidity such an important thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good questions. Like the first thing I would tend to, 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 to reply regarding that is, uh, you need to have like really good, a good entry and like a really big door to be able to onboard new users at a good price and offboard, uh, current user and make sure everyone is happy in the way they can, uh, enter and exit your ecosystem. So with the token. Uh, the other thing is when you have like liquidity, it tends to create also value uh, in your project because like people will be more comfortable using your protocol, knowing that they can exit at a good entry price when they want. Um, so it's kind of like core was a good example. Good liquidity of that, wasn't is it? like. Can you repeat that? Core was a good example of high liquidity attracting investors purely because it just had so much liquidity in it and people played in it because of that, right? Yeah, like, yeah, in my opinion, yes. is is definitely something that people want, like, because if you are, like, offering some incentives, uh, even if it's just, like, small rewards or, like, uh, offering some cash dividend or, like, share dividends, at the end of the day, like some people want to cash out and they want to, to do it at like a good price. So yeah, like the main reason is that and like the secondary effect of all of that is creating a, a indirect values. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's creating like good synergy for your product. So is like currently we're, we are working on integrating NPH on Bancor, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you are like creating new liquidity venue, also the other thing is you are exposing yourself, your project to a new community and it's creating more value also regarding that. So there is like kind of like different level order of effects. 
uh, that can be a benefit beneficial for for your product. Sure. For sure, not just price action, but also you know, like Sushi Swap. If you have liquidity pools on Sushi Swap, you get all of the marketing synergy that comes mm-hmm. with being friends with Sushi Swap. Um, Bancor is something that has been around for a while and people who are new to DeFi, especially some of my friends who are new to DeFi, don't really know so much about it. Um, the liquidity pairings are with BNT, the Bancor token, right? It would be, for example, MPH, BNT. Um, what's the benefit of that? Uh, the, the, the first benefit is just making sure that uh, you can uh, like uh, the get tried or get protected of, about the impermanent laws. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is this kind of things where uh, after some weeks of usage of um, you are like a uh, liquidity provider for uh, the pair on BNT, uh, you will have some EL protection. So that's really a, a really good use case for Bancor. And is the way also you can be sure you have like some LP acquisition regarding that, like it's really a, a good benefit. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is uh, you can have like some incentives directly financed by the bank or treasury where they can put some uh, liquidity mining incentives on top of it. Like as far as I know, their plan is to move also uh, to new kind of pair where you can have like not just ERC20 BNT, but you can have like whatever ERC20 paired with whatever ERC20 okay. and joint mining rewards. So apparently it's, it's in their backlog. I don't know when they plan to release that, but uh, hopefully soon. So I think it's really interesting if you can get early in the ecosystem of Bancor and like really start making your place there as a, as a project. Uh, I suppose it will be interesting for you uh, as a as a founder, as a builder, but also for the community as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and a good takeaway is the impermanent protection, uh, impermanent loss protection. Because in my experience of adding liquidity to five projects, I've been wrecked every single time by impermanent loss. So <laughs> for me, it's like I keep going back to liquidity provision, thinking, ah, this will work for me, but uh, I just get wrecked every time. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. If you are like the, the best advice I can give you regarding that is if you are in the second pool where you are like, uh, farming the native token of a pro of the project, but with the, in the pair with the native pro- token, uh, the best thing you can do to protect you is like selling as soon as possible the rewards you are, you are, you're making, but it doesn't protect at all about impermanent loss, but at least maybe you can have like some some benefits at the end, sure. some profits, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yes, maybe. It's uh, And as you said, you know, it's the, the gas fees are quite prohibitive for people who are not considered, you know, whales or even close to whales. Was it minnows? Is that the word for people who are not whales? Um, people like this <laughs> trying to... <laughs> <don't know. laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I'm a whale. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not a whale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. anyways you've been in it for a while so you deserve it um speaking of being in it for a while i i saw so some people may not know your partner is zefram z um uh, i saw him recently post on his twitter how old do you think i am and uh, he had four choices it was under 21 21 to 25 25 to 35 and 35 plus or something uh, I voted 21 to 25, and I was correct, apparently. is I mean, without doxing him, is he actually 21 years old? Yeah. No, that's so crazy. Um, so this brings me to an interesting point. Of, so uh, MPH, AT MPH's native token, MPH, has been listed on Rari Capital's Fuse pools uh, for you can borrow and you can, you can lend. Um, Rari Capital's team... Am I right in saying this, that they are aged between 15 years old and 21, being 21 being the oldest member? I can't answer that one. But uh, if you say, if you heard it, maybe it's true. And it won't surprise me at all. Like, definitely not. So um, I don't know if you've heard of the Twitter personality, Chris Black. Yeah. Yeah, so Chris Black was outed um, by some... Uh, you know, a DeFi crowd 
for doxing one of them who was literally 15 years old. And he released information about this 15 year old developer for Rari Capital. And there was a big storm coming out about how the nine people in charge of Rari Capital are aged between, do you know, it may even be 14 years old, between 14 years old and <laughs> 21 years old. And the majority of them were under 18. So this begs the question because I, before I heard any of this news, I've heard nothing but amazing things about Rari Capital from people whose opinions I really respect and who have been in the space for a long time. So do you feel like this is just like an anomaly in terms of, you know, 14, 15, or do you think that this whole younger people being at the forefront of innovation, being at the forefront of, you know, the actual functioning technology, do you think this is a new thing or is it something that might fade? Um, um, I, I suppose it's really good news uh, and really like uh, optimistic news in the sense that people age of 14 are interested by like finance and building stuff. Like it's really something that for me is a good news for this world. Um, an anomaly probably because like it's not definitive average. Um, like the founders and builders I know, like they are like the, the average is 25, 35, you know, like in this range. Mm -hmm. But this is like usually the case for like all the startup stuff and like this kind of, this kind of world. Um, but it's def like for me, it's definitely good news. And I'm happy to see this kind of people building after I understand that they can build anonymously or like they want to be like not doxed because some guys will think that they know more because they are like 30 or 35 uh it's definitely bullshit for me because it's just you can not the really, case, yeah. really really yeah you can re re you could be really really calling you an expert in something uh like saying to everyone bragging yeah i have 10 years of experience i have a a background in finance and I was like in that university, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, when these guys like they are telling you that is probably the worst guy you can meet in your life. And so I won't judge a guy who is building stuff in his 14, like he's, they are doing great. And that's really for me, like something we need to encourage and not just like shitting on them and saying, oh yeah, they are like super new and they don't know anything. Probably they know more than what you you could think about it. So, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, um, I think it's kind of it's kind of like opening up a lot of opportunities for people of all kinds. I mean, especially globally. That's the thing I love about the crypto space at the moment is that globally it's opening up so many opportunities for everyone. Like for example, your mm -hmm. NFTs that the AT MPH has a whole bunch of NFTs that they incentivize all kinds of things with. Um, dishing them out like no man's business. They're really great. And one of the guys you work with is a guy called uh, Man With No Name. And you say he's he's a Brazilian artist, right? And it's just like yep. COVID has locked everyone down. Obviously, the internet has been around for a while, but never before have I seen so many people from so many different communities, so many different countries speaking so many different languages all coming together for a, you know, to make a tokens number go up or what, what, whatever you want to say the common goal is. But people coming together all over the world is probably my favorite part of the whole DeFi explosion as they say um i do i do wonder as a kind of ethereum builder my impression of you is that you're always busy um and then for some people on other projects that don't do so much my impression of them is that they're never busy and that they work like two hours a day um so obviously you're your own boss when you do something like this. Do you kind of stick to like a like a working schedule or do you just kind of, you know, whenever the initiative to sit and code hits you, you sit and do that? Or do you, you know, give yourself a working hour schedule? Uh, definitely no schedule. Uh, maybe it's like not the best way of using my time. I am the guy who is reading a lot of books regarding like all to organize yourself and be less messy, this kind of thing, you know, but like I'm never putting that in practice. Um, so I tend to invest a, sh 
a lot of hours into it at MPH, but it's, I suppose it's pretty because I like it and it's not a work for me. Like it's not a job for mm-hmm. me. It's really what I want and what I like doing. So I don't know what else I can do in my life. You know, it's just, uh, I'm happy doing that. And I wanted to do that since a long time. So I know I'm really happy where am I with that and like spending two hours like some days I'm just spending two hours but some other days I'm like 12 hours uh, in front of my computer and just working on 88 mph and it's fine the, the, the one thing is uh, you need to find an equilibrium and spending time with your family and everything else because like uh, a sh- 20 like just personal not regarding like 2020 and the beginning of 2021 it was really a tough uh tough year for me and my my, my relatives uh so i i'm learning to to make sure i have some free time for spending uh, this time with people that, that matter so yeah it's a, a hard equilibrium uh, especially when you are early stage and everything is exploding and you have like new initiatives everywhere in front of you and you want to take them all. Um, yeah, it's hard to, to manage. For sure. It's, it's certainly the most exciting space yeah. in the world right now, you know, the DeFi space, especially for someone who's so heavily involved as yourself. Like there must be some so much interesting shit going on 24 hours a day. You can just open up a tab, open up an email and someone's got something awesome to show you and you think, oh God, I could sit here for five hours and do this, but I won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like my background uh, was mainly into like the last decades, like I'm working since uh, 2010 um, and I was spending a lot of time in building e-commerce stuff uh, banking interfaces or like for insurance, uh, companies. So it was really, really something boring for me. So like onboarding into like the DeFi world and starting building crazy things where you have fun. Like you can like do like memeing all day long, your all day product long. and like, like all of it is a I, meme. The whole thing's a <laughs> meme. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. So it's really like really, I'm really thinking that I'm fortunate having like witnessing all of that and being part of that. I'm really happy. And what I want is really sharing all of that with uh, as much people as possible and onboarding new guys who want to build with us. Uh, Even newbies, like currently we are starting working with a visual done. Uh, It's an artist who who made the the last uh, images about like DeLorean stuff, like drifting or like sunset stuff yesterday and today. And this guy like never heard about Ethereum or used Ethereum before. It just started like some, some, some weeks ago. Um, And all about like, it was all about NFT stuff because of course he's like doing uh, creating stuff and wanted to 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 try this uh, this space but the good thing with like this explosion of nft nft interest is that it's it's onboarding new a new category of users yeah um and probably opening a new way of thinking about like what's happening in this space and like making it less technical and a bit more um yeah, creative, like uh, maybe creative as bullshit world, but uh, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, I think you know the, I mean. the, the NFT it, the NFT thing, you know, craze, whatever, is, right now is, um, it, it is really, really intense. But I think the, what it is doing is changing the game for crypto because before it was finance and tech. You know, if you're a techie guy, it was interesting. If you're a finance guy, it's kind of interesting. Um, but now NFTs is bringing in culture, right? And that's what's going to get everybody into it. I have some of my friends from back home who are, you know, into kind of producing music related things, you know, albums or whatnot. And they messaged me like, hey, we're talking about NFTs. And I thought, shit, this is like, this is really great. Because regardless of ball run, regardless this is a of... Up signal. No, I did, I did think that, man. I did think that. <laughs> but I haven't got any stables yet, so I don't want to be thinking that. <laughs> 
But yes, no, I did think this is a top signal. When my mum says, hey, Josh, how do I buy Bitcoin on Revolut? I say, just don't. <laughs> buy Ethereum. Nah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you know, yeah. This, these guys who are, you know, they're my cool friends, right? So they're all learning about NFTs, which means they're learning about crypto, which means that, you know, albums are going to be released on NFTs. Crypto is essentially going to be integrated into the mainstream structure, whatever, in any in any form. But the cryptocurrency blockchain concept is kind of here and it's in people's faces more than a, more than just bitcoin is expensive now you know it's actually got a tangible use case that people can see yeah. which is really great um yeah and there, there, like there's some guys who don't like what's happening with nfts yes, like I definitely <laughs> there is like a, there is there is a mania uh and it's like nature of things like obviously there will be new mania there is one currently there is a lot of bullshit around it but at the end of the day like there is like some obvious new paradigm created around the way we are dealing with cultural objects uh, with cultural products uh, with reaching new community like just an example with like a product that i'm not a fan I'm not a football fan, but there is Chili's, for example. They are bringing shit tons of users, uh, putting in front of like millions of eyes uh, the way we can do differently things, connecting uh, a community of fans with a club. Uh, so it's really something like I'm happy to see it. Like there is some things that are definitely wrong, uh, but as every de new development new cycle of evolution that would be like good things and bad things but make the things progress at the end and it's the same like since a long time we are hearing this uh uh rhetoric around like game and nft and cryptography and oh everything will be a a game changer like since three years we are like hearing this kind of thing since uh Crypto Kitty, like we are in this kind of things. Uh, but currently there is new things happening with Axie Infinity, for example, who are really cool and they have like a lot of new users and active users. I, I, I earned, I think it was like 25,000 uh, active daily users. So it's really it's a real something. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, starting to be a real thing and with a lot of community around. Uh, and what they need right now is like scaling. They have their thing with Polygon right now. So it's really cool to see that. And it's something that is mobile friendly. So it's like a, a, a really good thing to enter a new market, like especially like in like uh, new world things like Asia and uh, South America, this kind of thing where like having a laptop is not really like uh, the average. Uh, everyone has just a smartphone and it's fine. And I think it was really cool to see this kind of development. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was chatting to, on my last my last episode, I was chatting to Arjun Kolsi. He's um, the lead growth uh, for Polygon Matic. Um, and he mm -hmm. was going into detail about Polygon's integration of gaming and NFTs on Polygon. And it's super exciting. I thought he said Animal Crossing at one point, but he did not say Animal Crossing. But... Can you imagine when Animal Crossing, <laughs> at, at some point, it's going on Polygon? I, I, I said to him, now that you've thought of it, you have to do it. He says, yeah, we'll get in contact. So I'm kind of waiting for when all of my, you know, my favorite things when I was a child were, are, you know, especially Pokemon, some shit like that, right? Having your own Pokemon NFT, this kind of thing. Um, when that happens, when that pops, it's, it, it is going to go. That's the top signal when Pokemon release official Pokemon cards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time because I know you have to leave soon. So I'm going to ask you to tell me what happens to okay, just a backstory. 88 MPH on the 80 MPH website has 88 MPH.fm. It's a dope radio station that you can leave open uh for your web surfing music needs. And it's got an an associated NFT, and there's only 88 of them. And they, the speed of the car on the N N NFT changes according to the TVL locked into 80 MPH. So please, can you tell us 
what happens when it gets to 88 miles per hour. Yeah, the things we need is updating the the, the visual and the universe into this uh, radio because we we are sold out with the NFT and it wasn't the plan to be sold out as fast as uh, it was. So with Man With No Name, the, the deal is updating the experience there and uh, being prepared for when we will reach 88 mph. Uh, but I can't disclose anything right oh, now. Man. Uh, we are like stopping. <laughs> NDA, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought but, you were your own yeah, boss, right? Like you really, could, you're your own boss. You could do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not creating it. Like the, the good, like the, the, the backstory of about 88 MPHFM is a good example of what you can build with people who don't really weren't connected really with uh, the DeFi world before uh, 2020 at least. Uh, the deal with uh, Man With No Name was like, okay, build it for free for us. So he built it for free and we will shield your creation. So we are like kind of creating this kind of sponsorship stuff where uh, we are supporting an artist because we have like a we can share your work with all your audience and we can shield uh, your, pro your, your NFT, your creations, and you build for our community uh, in exchange. And is what we want to, to, to incentivize currently, the, this way of collaborating with artists and basically everyone creating is having this synergy where, oh, it's a win-win at the end and there is like uh, more upside at, at the end of the day for everyone. So if we were like just paying him for building this 88 MPHF and stuff, maybe at the end of the day, it will be less profitable for him by just making partnership where at the end you can sell whatever you want and you are sure that there will be someone chilling your product. So it's, yeah, it was a really a nice uh, way of uh, collaborating uh, with him. And it was really a good surprise. And I was, I wasn't like doing anything like that before, like mm -hmm. my past experiences, but it's really nice to see that it could be like something doable. And a lot of artists are open to it. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's really nice to see. The good thing is just the removal of the middleman has opened up, especially on the artist side, like especially on the creator side, the removal of the middleman, the gatekeeper or, you know, or whatever to, to producing art, selling art and getting paid a fair wage for your art, which is for the last however many years been criminally underpaid. Everyone listens to music and enjoys nice things like nice pictures, but very few people actually get paid what they should for it. So NFTs and, you know, projects that need shilling, that need incentivization, these sorts of, these sorts of synergies are really, really great. I do hope that what you said, mm. upside for everyone. That sounds to me like a thing you'd say in a bull market, but I hope that can continue next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this thing like, uh, yeah, you, you will need to adapt to the, mm. the variable according to the context mm. for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, before you go, I want you to tell me on a scale of one to 10, uh, 10 being super pleased, zero being very, very unhappy. Uni V3, how do you feel? uh eight uh mm. i i'm yeah i like i i i heard that there is like some people like uh, not really thinking that it's a smart move regarding like oh yeah like tv doesn't matter anymore for you guys like oh you will make business and blah blah blah, and blah, blah, blah. at the end of the day it's just like if you want to have like real business and making sure at the end of the day that like, there is a capital efficiency is what matter at the end. And everyone is looking for that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, like if, if you are like, for example, hearing Mona Elisa uh, uh, from Melon who was like talking about that like some weeks ago about this capital efficiency and was criticizing Uniswap or like every a, like AAM design currently, is is really because there is a bull run and because there is a need for credits but everything work uh if there wasn't a bull run all the current amm design would be a big failure 
Right. And I'm really sharing this opinion uh, with her and with other guys who are thinking that there is a better way. And for example, a smart guy that I really respect is the founder of Kyber, uh, Loilu. Uh, they're coming with a Kyber V3. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyber, uh, I think they are calling it Crystal. Um, and they are coming with a new version of their uh, their business and like going toward like uh, automated market making and other things to incentivize liquidity on their protocol and they are bringing new design so really with in mind capital efficiency and it's what matter at the end of the day so I'm looping back with what I was we were saying at the beginning like TVL absolute number is just bullshit stuff but people are happy to to brag about uh, on on Twitter mm -hmm. but. It's just, just working when there is like kind of mania, a bull run, but when number go down, mm. uh, it will be like another story for yeah, sure. Sure. Um, for me, I, I think the, the liquidity kind of mechanics that they've updated, I still need to get my head around it properly. I have, I do agree that capital efficiency is the thing that most people are looking for or should be looking for um, in terms of longevity. But I have a, do have a bit of a problem with their, again, I understand in terms of longevity and future profitability, but their restrictions on forking and licensing regulations, I think that's a little bit uh, anti-DeFi. <laughs> anti I don't know if that's a good thing to say. I think that's kind of rejecting a lot of where they've come from in terms of not allowing others to fork. However, I'm sure that won't stop the 100th Uniswap fork from popping up sometime soon? Uh, I, I, I suppose like it's just to please their partners because like whatever you will put on a blockchain like a firm, people, you won't put a fence between your work and people wanting to fork your thing. So at the end of the day, like you won't avoid people, Anand's guys, forking your things so smart contracts are open so mm -hmm. like it's just like to to please some guys who wanted to have this kind of uh, regulations regarding the, the license and the, the rights there but it's kind of just uh yeah a rubber stamp just yeah that makes sense <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah just words makes sense yeah at the end of the day you, yeah everything like internet like in everything r related to that is just a big copy pass machine so like <laughs> whatever you put on internet you are sure that it will copy it <laughs> copy pasta nice okay i'm gonna let you go um, <laughs> so, so you don't miss your meeting yeah thanks for your time josh yeah. really appreciated talking uh exchanging on all of that with you yeah, and nice. happy to to join you for another episode when you want yeah wicked thank you mcfly uh, i'm gonna use your non name thank you mate and i'll speak to you again soon yeah yeah see you see you bye